everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be going over heart sounds. What I want to be doing is I'm going to be covering the basics of the things you need to know about listening to those heart sounds, S1, S2, those extra heart sounds like S3, S4, heart murmur. And in the next video I'm actually going to be performing an assessment on a person and showing you by using the stethoscope how to find those anatomical positions when listening to the aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid, and mitral valves and walk you through how to do that. Now after this video, be sure to go to my website, registernursrn.com and take the free quiz that will test you on this theory of listening to heart sounds because a lot of times in your health assessment classes, for instance, you may be asked certain questions about when do you hear S1, where do you hear it best, and things like that. So that can help you prepare for your exams. And a card should be popping up so you can access that quiz. So let's get started. First, let's talk about the goal. What is the purpose of listening to heart sounds? Well, the reason we listen to heart sounds is to assess the closure of heart valves that are located in the heart where blood flows through because it tells us a lot about what's going on with the patient's heart. And we're listening to four valves. They're categorized into two sets. Um, the first set are your avioventricular valves, which are short for AV valves, and that includes your tricuspid and mitral valves. Your mitral valve is also called your bicuspid valve, so commit that to memory. And whenever these valves close, your tricuspid and your mitral, that is signifying the first sound you hear, the love sound, which is S1. Then we're looking at our semilunar valves, SL valves. And these are your aortic and pulmonic valves. And when they close, that is the S2 sound, and that is the dub. So it goes hand in hand. Whenever you're listening to the heart, you hear lub, dub. Lub is S1, dub is S2. Now, whenever the heart is relaxing and contracting, relaxing phase is diastole, the relaxing part. I like to remember that because a lot of people get those two confused. Di, um, Whenever a person dies, they're relaxing, so that's how I remember that. And the opposite of that is systole contraction. So when the heart is contracting and resting, these valves will be opening and closing during certain times. And let me walk you through this. It's very important you understand how the blood flows through the heart. I have another video on heart blood flow. If you're resty on that, a card should be popping up and you can access that. But let me walk you through it and tell you how the valves are opening and closing during diastole and systole. Okay, first let's cover some basic anatomy of the heart, and then we'll talk about the heart blood flow. Okay, you have your superior and inferior vena cava, you have your atrium, your right atrium, your tricuspid valve, your right ventricle, then you have your pulmonic valve, pulmonary artery, then you have the pulmonary vein, then you have the left atrium, bicuspid valve, left ventricle, aortic valve, and then the aorta. So what happens is that you, whenever blood is flowing through this side, it's flowing through that side. So what's happening on this side is happening on that side. Keep that in mind. So what happens is that these blue arrows signify unoxygenated blood. And what's happening is that blood has been used by the system and needs to come back through the heart to go through the lungs to get oxygenated so it can go back and do its job. So it flows in through the superior and inferior vena cava. Then it goes down to through your right atrium, down through your tricuspid valve, and into your ventricle. Now, right now we have diastole going on. Diastole again, what was that? That was relaxation. So it's nice and relaxed over here. And blood is just flowing down through the tricuspid valve. And how it can do that is in the atrium, the pressure is a lot higher than in the ventricle. But as the ventricle becomes full, it has a lot of pressure. And whenever it becomes full, it has a lot of pressure, it closes that avioventricular valves. And whenever those close, you will hear S1. And when you hear S1, that is the beginning of systole, the contraction phase. So systole happens, which is contraction, your ventricle contracts, that causes a lot of pressure on your semilunar valves, and they open up and allow blood to rush through up through the pul pulmonic um, artery right here and then they close because pressure falls. Once that blood goes through the pressure will fall and then you will hear S2 which is signifying the closure of those 
semilunar valves. And then it will flow through the pulmonary artery. It will become oxygenated with blood through the lungs. And then it will enter back through the pulmonary vein down through the left side of the heart. And it will go through the left atrium. Again, we have, we've entered back into diastole. And it's relaxed because blood is nicely flowing down through the bicuspid valve right here and the pressure is building in the ventricle and whenever it builds it will cause your bicuspid valve to shut so those avioventricular valves will shut you will hear s1 again and then um, that will be the marking of systole. The ventricle will contract, which will cause that increased pressure will cause those semilunar valves to open up, which right here is your aortic valve, and the blood will flow up through the aorta, go through the body, and give the body all that rich nutrients it needs. And then it just starts all over. And sometimes whenever you're listening to the heart, listening to that S1 and S2, those closing of those valves, you will sometimes hear extra heart sounds, which we'll go in depth here in a second. Um, you could hear a sound like S3, S4, heart murmurs, and splits. And I'm gonna go over in great detail on how to position the patient properly, how to use the proper part of your stethoscope whenever you're listening for those sounds, because it takes a little bit of technique. And in the next video, I'll be covering that in depth as well. Okay, so let's go over the stethoscope basics, because in order to hear these heart sounds, you have to know how to use your stethoscope. Okay. The diaphragm of your stethoscope. That is the big part of it. This is um, found on your chest piece and it hears high pitched sounds. It is great listening throughout the chest for S1, S2, and your aortic and pulmonic murmurs where you have regurgitation. So that is great for that. Then you can use the bell. Just switch it over depending on what type of stethoscope you have. This is a smaller part, and this is best for low pitch sounds. Remember, low is small. Remember, the smallest side of the stethoscope is the bell, and that likes to pick up those low pitch noises. And this is perfect for assessing for S3, S4, and your mitral stenosis murmurs, which we'll go over here in a second. And also, as you're listening with your stethoscope, it's best to inch the chest piece across the chest instead of just picking up and just moving it. Just inch it so you can continue hearing that rhythm because the main goal is trying to distinguish S1 from S2. So inch it over. Don't listen over close because that interferes with sound. And especially if you are new to listening to heart sounds, you need to make sure that you're listening straight on the chest because you need to learn what normal sounds sound like. And make sure you're decreasing your background noise because that can interfere. And get a stethoscope that fits your ears. And practice, practice, practice. This skill takes a lot of practice. Okay, patient positioning. The key to hearing a lot of these sounds depends on patient positioning because your heart is behind your sternum and your ribs and you need to make sure you're moving the patient to get the best acoustic sound. So here are some tips. Okay, whenever you're listening, you normally start out, you can have the patient lay down, sitting up, and you are going to be listening with the diaphragm of your stethoscope for S1 and S2. And we'll go over the anatomical positions here in a second. And then, to listen for that S3, that S4, because after you get familiar with S1 and S2, you'll turn them over on their left side. And why do you do that? Majority of the heart is on the left side of the body. So when you lay the patient back, turn them on the left side, that's gonna shift that heart over there. And you're gonna listen at the apex. The apex is the bottom, it's the opposite of the heart. It seems like the base would be here and the apex up there, but it's the opposite. The apex is at the bottom and the base is at the top. So you're gonna listen at the apex of the heart whenever you're listening for S3, S4, and those mitral um, murmurs. Then you'll want to set the patient up, lean them forward and have them exhale. And what this does, as if you're looking at the diagram of the chest, this moves the heart forward because you're wanting to pay attention to the aortic and the pulmonic valves and you're listening for that regurgitation, that murmur. Now, it's really important whenever you're starting out that you understand where your landmarks are, where you will place your chest piece to listen to those valves and what each valve, what sound it reflects. So this is the meat and potatoes of the lecture. 
Okay, to help you remember the order of how to listen to these valves, I like to remember the mnemonic, all patients take medicine. A for aortic, P for pulmonic, T for tricuspid, and M for mitral. And to do that, what I like to do is I like to find the clavicle, then I like to go find the angle of Lewis, and right below that angle, because attaching to that, is your second rib. And um, what we're gonna do is we'll start on the right side with our chest piece of our stethoscope, and we're gonna listen to the aortic valve. And it is found in the second intercostal space. And no, it is the only landmark area found on the right side of the chest. It's right next to the sternal border. And again, what does the aortic valve reflect the sound of whenever it closes? S2, and it's found at pretty much the base of the heart. Then you're gonna go right across. So you're just gonna take your stethoscope and then you're gonna go right across to the other second intercostal space, which is on the left side of the heart, and you're gonna listen to the pulmonic valve. And again, these two are semi-lunar valves, and this reflects the sound of S2, the closure of S2, and this will be your pulmonic valve. Then you'll find the third rib go down through the third intercostal space, and this is Herb's point. This is the halfway point between the base and the apex of the heart. Then you'll enter stethoscope down to the fourth intercostal space and listen to the tricuspid valve. And this reflects S1 when it closes. And it is an avo avioventricular valve, the AV valve. Then after listening to that, you will enter chest piece down to the mid -cl clavicular area, which here's your clavicle. You're gonna go midway through that. And you're gonna go to the fifth intercostal space. And you are gonna be listening at the mitral valve Part. This is also the point of maximal Im impulse. And this is the apex of the heart, so you will listen there. Okay, whenever you start out listening for those heart sounds, typically what you're gonna do is you're gonna either have the patient laying down, you're gonna have them sit or sitting up, and you're going to listen with the diaphragm of your stethoscope at these landmarks, starting with the aortic and working your way through the pulmonic, herbs point, tricuspid, and mitral. And as you are listening, you are listening to the rhythm. Is it nice and regular or is it irregular? And the rate. Then you are trying to listen for and distinguish between S1 and S2. Whenever you're first starting out, this can be complicated, but there are some tricks you can do to help you find out is this lub or is this dub? Okay, first what you wanna do is you will use, you can use this trick. S1 is louder at the apex of the heart. So in the mitral area, it's gonna be like lub, dub, lub, dub. Lub will be louder than dub, which is S1. Now S2 is louder at the base. So it'll be more like lub, dub, lub, dub. So listening at those different areas can help you distinguish. Also, another thing you can do is if your patient is on a bedside EKG monitor, this helps. Whenever you are looking at your QRS complex, the R wave will correlate with S1. So as you're listening with your stethoscope, watch that bedside monitor. Every time you see that peak of the R wave and you hear that noise, that's S1. So that helps you distinguish that. Or you can have the patient, while you're listening, you can feel on the carotid ar arteries pulsation. Whenever you feel a pulsation, you hear the sound, that is S1 because they go hand in hand. So those are some tricks on how you can distinguish those. Because it's important you distinguish those so you can hear those other extra heart sounds if they have them, like S3, S4, and things like that. Um, also note, a patient can have splitting of S1 and S2. So that's another thing you're listening for. And what that is, is as we were talking about through the blood flow of the heart, the AV valves, AV ventricular valves, which are your tricuspid and bicuspid, they are closing usually, normally they are closing at this, opening and closing at the same time. But sometimes if they have a split, one will close before the other, and that's just what you're hearing. And that can also happen with S2. Remember, your S semilunar valves represent S2, and your aortic or your pulmonic valves are not closing at the same time, so you're hearing them close um, a little bit differently. Now, S1, a typical cause of S1, just to let you know, could be a right bundle branch block. That's where the right bundle is being blocked through the electrical conduction system of the heart. I have a video on the electrical conduction system if you're not familiar with that, and that is why um, the patient may have an S1. 
Now let's talk about those extra heart sounds that you may or may not hear, S3, S4, and murmurs. Okay, S3, what you need to know is when it's heard, what are the causes? This is typically heard after S2, and let me explain the pathophysiology behind this. Okay, what's it gonna sound like? It's gonna sound like lub dub t, lub dub t. Lub represents S1, the closure of S1, your AB valves. Um, dub represents S2, the closure of those semilunar valves, and then you hear t. Now, remember, when your semilunar valves close, what does that represent? It's the end of. It's the end of systole contraction. And now it's the, what's gonna happen is the heart's gonna relax and allow it to fill up again. So what's happened, your semilunar valves shut because they've already done their job by shooting the blood out, and then the heart's in diastole, where you have the atrium, flowing the blood down through the ventricles. And what you're hearing is that vibration noise of the ventricles filling up. So that's why you're hearing it after S2. And a cause of that could be, um, could be fluid volume overload or heart failure. And this is typically, again, best heard if you put the patient on the left side and use the bell of the stethoscope because it's a low pitch noise. Okay, let's look at S4 now. S4 is heard before S1. So it's gonna sound like ta lub da, ta lub da. You're gonna hear that extra sound before the lub da, which is the opposite of how S3 was. You heard it after the lub da. And this is usually caused due to that atria kick that during that pre-systole part um, where the atrium is trying to push blood down into those resistant ventricles. So the ventricles are resistant, they don't wanna do their job, so the atrium just has to give them one more kick and what you're hearing is that. Murmurs, what are murmurs? Heart murmurs are where you hear with your chest piece whenever you're listening throughout the heart, you will hear either like a blowing or a swishing noise. And this is due to the turbulence of blood flow either through the blood chambers or or through the valves. Maybe there's a wall defect or the valve, like the mitral valve, any of the valves are too narrow, which are like mitral stenosis, or they're having regurgitation issues where the valve isn't shutting all the way and blood is back flowing and you're hearing that. And um, it can be at different levels how loud they are. They are graded as the following. A grade one, it's hard to hear, but you can hear it, you barely hear it. A grade two is faint, but you hear it. Grade three is easy to hear. Grade four and onward, the patient will have a thrill. And this, um, grade four is usually loud with a thrill. Um, a grade five is very loud with a thrill and you can lift just the corner of your chest piece of your stethoscope off and you can still hear it. And a grade six is the loudest of them all and they'll have a thrill and you can lift the whole chest piece off of the chest and you can still hear the murmur. Okay, so that is a little bit about heart sounds, the basics of what you need to know for nursing school. Now, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to go take that quiz to test your knowledge on this and be sure to check out my next video where I will be performing the assessment skill on how to auscultate heart sounds. And thank you so much for watching and please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel.